Hello, this is Roman Gabriel, and you are listening to The Grilling Truth. Welcome to the Grilling Truth NFL Legends Show, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, a new interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. As always, for the Legends Show, I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster, and right now I want to welcome in the quarterback for the 1966 National Championship Notre Dame and also was around for two Pittsburgh Steelers who were... I guess you got two Super Bowl rings, Terry. Help me welcome to the show, Terry Hanratty. Well, thank you, Mike. Good to be here. I do have two with uh, Super Bowl nine and ten. Yeah, that's not too bad of an accomplishment. Heck, Dan Marino would like to have one, Terry. There you go. <laughs> he was he was he was pretty good though. He was pretty good. Yeah, he wasn't too bad, and he grew up kind of in the same neck of the woods you did. I know you grew up in Western Pennsylvania, Steel Mill Town. You want to talk to us a little bit about what your early life was like? Yeah, Dan was uh, from Pittsburgh, I think Central Catholic, and yeah. uh, my hometown, Butler, Pennsylvania, which is about 25 miles north. And if you look at the, you know, they call that the cradle of quarterbacks. I mean, there's been, you know, you, you go with uh, Montana, Marino, uh, Namath, Unitas, Blanda, uh, you know, just, a, you know, uh, Jim Kelly, Hostetler. I mean, there's been a bevy of quarterbacks coming from Western Pennsylvania, and it was Back then, you know, when we when the steel mills were going strong and when the when the coal mines were, you know, producing, you know, the people who worked in those industries bred big, strong kids. But now, you know, with the steel mills, you know, this thing of the past in the Pittsburgh area, and you know, there's very little coal anymore, and you know, it's a different atmosphere now. But back then, you know, football was the king. I would, you know, I would compare that to any. You know, they let's say the '60s and '70s to any area of the country. We you know they yeah, talk it was now like about, Texas or Florida is right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just you know, what was it? I had a uh, scout one time say, if you were, uh, if you got the top hundred kids in the country, you'd have ten or fifteen of them from Western Pennsylvania. So that was, you know, yeah. that's a pretty yeah, good I think good I deal. saw where your high school coach coach what sixty one guys that ended up going to Division one colleges. We had seen in a twenty-year period, he produced sixty-two guys in Division One. Uh, yeah, that's three a year. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it really so he, is. I mean, I mean, we're talking big, and, that, and that's not including back then. They had, you know, state teachers' college, you know, which are all around the Pennsylvania in the Pennsylvania area. You, know, you always hear Slippery Rock, but there's you know there's many more like that. But now they're all universities. But you know, a lot of kids played at those smaller schools too. So there was a lot of kids, you know. And if uh, you know, you know, we always talk that. Of those 62 guys, probably about four or five could have afforded to go to college if you just went yeah. on a, you know, strictly academics. And so he put, you know, he put a good 58 kids, you know, gave them, uh, you know, college education. So that's, you know, it's quite a feat. So talk a little bit about your high school career at Butler. Um, and when did you know that you had the ability to maybe play at a higher level? Well, we had a, a sort of a, a different atmosphere than you know we had a, you know my graduating class was 980 kids we were the second second biggest high school in Pennsylvania and it was typical you know there's a lot of if people remember the you know the Woody Hayes days four yards in a cloud of dust and so you you know the quarterback really didn't throw the ball much and you know I I was you know I had the arm and all that stuff but you didn't you didn't get to play quarterback until you know, the, the kid ahead of you had graduated. So I played defense yeah. for my sophomore, junior year. And not till my senior year in high school did I actually start at quarterback. We put up 299 points in nine games. You know, that's in the, in the early 60s. So, yeah, that's you know, more we were, 30 points a game. Yeah, you know, we were airing out pretty good. So, and, you know, we had a lot of success and all that good stuff. And, you know, then all the, all the coaches started coming around and, you know, finding who the hell is this, you know, kid from Butler, Pennsylvania. So I only played, you know, I played, started nine games. <clears throat> then the next game I started at quarterback was my sophomore year because you couldn't play as freshman in, in college back then. Yeah, but before we get to that, what made you pick Notre Dame? 
Uh, I was almost signed, sealed, and delivered to uh, Michigan State. You know, I went up there a couple times, and, you know, Duffy and the, and the guys came to, uh, came to, to uh, Butler, and Duffy Doherty was just a great, great guy. Yeah, and, they had guys uh, like Bubba Smith. I mean, that was a great program when he was there. Well, they brought, you know, they brought all the black athletes from Texas up to uh, Michigan State. You know, that was the, 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 the pipeline they had there, and they had, you know, great talent. And, uh, you know, so we had, uh, and my, uh, one of the coaches at Notre Dame said, listen, you know, Eric Parsegian was gonna, is going to be in Pittsburgh, which is 25 miles away, so you, could you meet him? So I went down to Pittsburgh, spent an hour and had lunch with him and uh, came home, told my mother I'm going to Notre Dame. I mean, he was just that, that uh, classy and dramatic of a person that, you know, something, some person you wanted to be around for the next four years. And the hardest thing I had to do was call Duffy. You know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen? He's going to yell and scream, whatever, you know, this and that and this and that. But for the next 20 minutes, he went on and told me what a great school Notre Dame was, what a great coach era was. And he made a very difficult uh, uh, call for a 17-year-old kid very easy. So, you know, I've always appreciated him for that. Well, I mean, that's what makes a great coach is somebody that cares about the kids. Yeah, but you you rarely see it anymore. You always you know you you hear now. That's why there's not too many great coaches anymore. No, no, it, it, it you know it's it's a it's a dying breed. You know, coaches that spend ten, fifteen, twenty years at a school anymore. You know, normally you know I got three years, and if they don't they don't have a national championship in their pocket, they're gone, or they're they're having some kind of NCAA violation against them, and you know, it's it's uh it's, it's a it's a vicious cycle at this point. Now, you, you talked a little bit about Eric Parsegian, one of the great coaches in college football history. Um, he, he was a guy that came from Northwestern. Notre Dame's program was down. He turned him around pretty much immediately. What was it like to play for him? He was, you know, I was, we, I was his first recruiting class. And, uh, you know, Notre Dame always had the talent. But they just didn't, you know, when, when Eric got there, he got – he plugged the guys in the right spot. You know, John Hewitt never – got a chance to play. All of a sudden, he wins the Heisman Trophy that one year. He yeah. was with Era. You know, Jack Snow, you know, he was the number one receiver in the country at that time. And they, they brought, you know, the offensive lineman. They put him on defense. They put the defensive lineman on offense. You know, he really just reconstructed the whole team. And, uh, you know, except for a, a bad call out there in Southern California, he would have had a national championship in 64. In 65, you know, when my freshman year, uh, you know, we – we had a great, great guy at quarterback who couldn't hit, you know, I don't want to say hit, couldn't hit a bull in the ass, but, uh, you know, Bill was, <laughs> Bill, Bill's luck was a great guy. You know, he's a judge in, in Florida now. But, uh, you know, and that's all they needed was, you know, a quarterback then. I'd be, I remember sitting up in the stands saying, oh, man, I wish I could play on this team. Because, well, you know, it's a great team. Yeah. And they had great running backs and great defense. And, you know, I remember Michigan State playing us at Notre Dame, and I think it was – well, three, I think, it was the score, 12 nothing or something like that. I said, man, if you could just get, you know, a couple touchdowns, <laughs> that's what you need to win this thing. Yeah. But then, you know, 66, you know, we put it all together. It was, it was a lot of fun. We had, yeah, you, had you great, talk about you know, the 66 team, your sophomore year. What was it that made that team so special? Well, we had, a, we had, we had everything. You know, we had a very, you know, the only, there were only two question marks. That was Jim Seymour and myself. You know, we had a yeah, great Jim defense. Seymour ended up being a great wide receiver. Yeah, we had, you know we had a great offensive line, we had great running backs, we had a great defense. You know, our defense uh, gave up I think it was two point eight points per game back then. I mean, we had shutouts galore all over the place. I think like five in a row shutouts. Yeah, I think you guys for the year were something like three hundred and twenty nine to thirty eight or something, weren't you? Yeah, it was absolutely wild. And you know, we went down and we played. I think three. We played four top ten teams. You know, Michigan State tied us, and we, you know, beat the uh, beat Purdue. We beat uh, uh, what was the other? Purdue, uh, Oklahoma. We played down in Norman. We beat them thirty-eight nothing in Norman. Yeah, and, and I forget who the other one was. But uh, uh, you know, I know you guys finished the season. Then you beat USC like fifty-one to ten. That's or the other one. That's the other one. Fifty-one yeah. nothing. And the game everybody remembers is the 66 Michigan State game, and I know Eric takes a lot of heat for it. You guys were in a tie game with a minute to go on your own 30. But I think this, I don't know, maybe you can shed a little light on us, because I always wanted to know this. I know you got hurt early in the game, 
and so did your star running back, Nick Eddy. Do you think that right. had any effect on Era's decision not to try to get down the field in that last minute? Well, it would have been, a, you know, everybody forgets about it. The Michigan State punted the ball to us with, the, like, two and change to go from the 50. Yeah. Now, they were in a lot better place to go. They were at home. They were a lot, lot place better to go for the win right there. And, uh, you know, we, we tried, you know, Coley O'Brien was, was playing the game. He, back, he was my backup, and, you know, I separated my shoulder in the first game, in the first quarter. And G- George Gedeke, our starting center, he got hurt. He was out of the game. Uh, Nick Eddy, you know, slipped on the train getting up there and uh, hurt his shoulder. He didn't even dress. I mean, he dressed for the game and didn't play. And uh, we just had a lot a lot going against us, and we were on the road. You know, we had a tie. We, You know, we had the ball, on, I, think it was about the, I think it was on the 20 the last series, a minute and change to go. And we tried to throw, and Coley got sacked. So now, you know, second and, you know, we've got 12 yards to go, and they got a kicker and kicked the ball 50 yards. And that's crazy yeah. to, you know, put the ball up in the air. I mean, they had a lot better shot to go for it than we did. And Eric well, took a I, lot I of would say you're dead. He was kind of, I mean, he kind of did that just because he didn't have a starting quarterback in the game. Well, you know, that, that's also, but, you know, you're still, even at that point, you know, one little mistake and you've lost your whole season. Yeah. You know, and we had Southern Cal to play the, the following week. So, you know, we could, you know, we were at Michigan State, so we were, you know, the game was tied. You know, if you're number one, you yeah, got to Yeah, and weren't you guys down game. like 10 to nothing, like in the first quarter or so? And actually yeah, came back well, we're and tied. nothing. We came back and tied it, tied it up, and uh, you know we we, came, we went through a lot, to, you know, come back in that game. But it was, you know, to this day, I still think it's the two best teams talent wise ever to play each other. I mean, Michigan State had a ton of talent on that team, you know, both sides of the ball. We had a lot of talent on both sides of the ball, and it was just too great. You know, it was you know it was it was a it was a you know a, uh, a nutcracker. I mean that was that game was heavy hitting, <laughs> and it was uh, interesting. You know, you know when you look back on it. All right, so you touched on the USC game the next week, but the rivalry has always got to me. I'm I'm an Indiana boy. I mean, I grew up in the '70s, '80s cheering for Notre Dame. Um, the Notre Dame USC rivalry. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, that's that's been that's sort of a mystery to me because I only played one game. You know, when the Michigan at that '66 when we won the national championship, I you know I had a separated shoulders, so I was in a cast. Then my senior year, when uh, when we I had uh, knee operation, so when we went to California. I was in a cast on my leg. Yeah, I and, forgot about uh, that. Okay. And my junior year, I threw five picks at, at Notre Dame. We'll, we'll skip so over to USC rivalries. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't have fond memories too. You know, two injuries in a, in a horrible game. <laughs> well, then 1969, you get drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, that had to be an exciting moment for a Western Pennsylvania kid. Yeah, coming back home like that, well, you know, as uh, Steelers have had a rough go of it for the first 40 years. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Chuck Noll was his first year, and, you know, Joe Green was drafted number one. I was drafted number two. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, you know, I'm, I wasn't used to losing anywhere in major league, high school, college, but you know, we did the '69 was not a good team. You know, we won one and thirteen. You know, won our first game against Detroit, then lost thirteen in a row. So that was sort of a, sort of a, uh, you know, a reality check about football there. So it was. The, yeah, you know, we had Andy Russell on the show about a year ago, and. He went into detail on that season and Chuck Knoll's famous speeches and everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had uh, – I remember we played up in Chicago. That was uh, that was Chicago's only win. And, you know, the first safety I ever got thrown for in my life. I and mean, we never we never crossed the 50. And in the fourth quarter when they're up like 38 to zero, you know, there's still safety blitz in it's, you know, weak side blitz, strong side blitz, all blitz, you know. And it was we just couldn't stop them. And I know after the game, there was almost a fight on the field with, with the coaching staff. You know, what the hell are you doing running up like yeah, that? I didn't realize. I wonder if there's ever been two Hall of Fame coaches that both ended up with one one seasons that played each other in that year. Uh, because, I mean, who Chicago was, had Hallis at the time, didn't they? No, no, that was after Hallis. Oh, okay. I think so. You know, I'm not sure. I know that. Hallis retired I, I, somewhere around there. I know that. Yeah, yeah, you might be right on that. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. I might be wrong, was, too, though, after I think about it. 
No, but it was, it was just one of those things. I mean, they just we just we were horrible because you know the coaching staff just went crazy after each other. But uh, on onward up over, you knew you knew Chuck had a plan, and Chuck was very deliberate. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, and you know that the plan was it was in place the second year. You know, he got rid of a lot of guys on the team. You know, he, Chuck never wanted to really trade for anybody because he didn't want to have to break some of their old habits and, and teach them his habits. Yeah, but and I mean, heck, well, you don't have to trade for people when you're having drafts where you pick up four guys and end up in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's the that's the, that's their it was their real strength. We had, you know, we had great, you know, uh, uh, Artie Artie Rooney, Art Rooney. Junior. Yeah, and that was actually my next question. I mean, what kind of man was Art Rooney to play for? Because I know every Steeler, and I've probably interviewed fifteen of them, all of them absolutely loved the man. Well, you you came in the locker room after every game, and you never knew whether we win, whether we won or lost. Because he would have the same expression, you know, good game, son, good game, boy. And he'd go around the locker room and you know, patting guys on the back and you know, saying, okay, you know. And it was just a joy to uh, to play for the Rooney family. You know they have to be great when you look back on it and you and you and you think they've had three coaches since yeah. 1969. So they got to be doing something right. You know if I was any college college president or or uh, or owner of a, a team, I'd say go spend a week in Pittsburgh, please, and talk to the Rooney family and see what they do, how they do things. Because you know they do it the right way. You know they they get the right people in there. They get good people in there, and uh, they stick with them. I mean Chuck. You know for the first think about it. There's m- many teams that hired a coach. Chuck Noll came from Baltimore, who you know was a defensive coach. Nobody knew who he was. And to go one and thirteen, there you know half the teams in this league would have you know fired him right there. But the Roonies knew something, and they just stuck with Chuck, and he had a plan, he had a plan, and obviously it worked. Yeah, if you think about it, the next two guys they hired, Cower and Tomlin, I mean, it wasn't like people thought they were slam dunk going to be great head coaches. No, but they knew they knew the, the blend that they wanted. And, you know, you give you give Cower and Tomlin a lot of credit for what they've done. But Chuck really made the mold, and they sort of stuck with it, you know, with the big defense, strong defense, big running game, and, you know, quarterback play. And they, yeah, and I uh, think Chuck Knoll's one of the most underrated coaches that ever lived. Well, never, you know, he won four Super Bowls, never coach of the year. Yeah. And when and when you go, the uh, Steelers have won, when we won our first Super Bowl nine, I think it was 41 or two years, and we had never won a championship. So yeah, you think I, that I don't would even be know. The they, they'd only been played like one playoff game, if, if one playoff game in the first four yeah, years. Yeah, no, it, it was absolutely wild, and but... Uh, Chuck really didn't didn't want, you know. He he had a radio, he had a TV show for one year, then he wouldn't do it anymore. It was just, you know, he just didn't like that stuff. Yeah, and he was a football coach, and that's what he wanted to do. He didn't care what you thought of him or anybody thought of him. There's one so guy. So he would have been more him. in the Bill Belichick mold. <clears throat> he just yeah. wanted everybody to leave him alone so he could coach his team. Exactly, and uh, and Paul Zimmerman from. Uh, from New York was the only one that could get get to Chuck because Paul also for the New York Times he wrote and I think he may still writes a uh, he's a wine connoisseur yeah so he writes a column on wine and Chuck at that time was a mini wine connoisseur so Paul played the the right card and said listen Chuck I'll come in we'll spend an hour talking about wine then we'll spend an hour talking about football Chuck said. Perfect. Let's do that. So Paul used to come in and talk about the the wine, and he would talk about football. And you know, he got closer to Chuck than any anybody else, except for you know a couple local guys. Yeah. All right. So 1970, we fast forward. You had been a second round pick. The next year, they picked Terry Bradshaw in the first round. What were your feelings when they did that? Well, you knew that. Uh, you know that the. the 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 the, uh, the saying back then you, you take the best available athlete, uh, so it just happened to be in my position. Yeah. And, you know you don't you don't run from competition. You know when I went to Notre Dame there were four four quarterbacks and all four were all state in their yeah. given state. You know and no one left. 
like they do today. Everybody spent all the time there. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you just, you know, you, you compete. You just, you know, try, try to do your best, and that's about it. You know, there was no free agency back then, so you had no say where you could go, whatever. But, uh, you know, you just kept, kept your head down and keep working. All right, so you were there in 72 when the Steelers, after all those years, finally made the playoffs. I mean, what was the atmosphere around Pittsburgh? I mean, a football-crazy town that had never seen anything like that. That had to be special. It was really, really neat. And we won that first Super Bowl just to see the smile on Mr. Rooney's face. I mean, that was, you know, the ultimate. His cigar hanging out and that him, him holding that trophy. You know, that was really, really neat. And, you know, the people in Pittsburgh, you know, they're so loyal. And they're, they're such good people. And they were just just ecstatic about, you know, what, what we did. Then to come back and do it the next year was, you know, even crazier. You know, no one, at that time, no one went back-to-back Super Bowls. Yeah, and you got to take the last few snaps of that game, too, if I remember correctly. I did, correct, yeah, down in, down in Miami against Dallas. Yeah, great football game. Dallas was a great team with a great coach, too, with Tom Landry. The Steelers-Cowboys yeah. were always great games. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean... We'll move on. The other thing I remember, I was like 12 years old, the movie Fighting Back came out about Rocky Blyer. Loved the right, movie. Right. I remember you were one of his best friends in the movie. I assume that it was like that in real life. You want to talk about Rocky a little bit? Oh, well, Rocky's just one of, the, you know, one of the great stories. You know, he came back from Vietnam. You know, he was, we played together in Notre Dame, and he was our captain. He was one year ahead of me. And uh, when he came back from Vietnam, he stayed with my family. And I, you know, he, he could barely walk. I mean, he, had, he tried to jog. It was a horrible limp. And the Rooney's were wonderful. They said, listen, Rocky, you know, we don't need you. You know, you don't need to do this. You know, we'll send you to law. They offered to pay for his law school there in Pittsburgh. And I kept telling Rocky, I said, go to law school. Go to law school. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to do this. And if you'd have bet me back then that he would have rushed for 1,000 yards in the NFL, I would have lost everything. <laughs> That Rock was just such a great technician. You know, he's one of the best blocking backs ever to play the game. You know, he cleared away from Franco a lot. He had great yeah. hands. You know, he was not a burner, but, you know, he could get through the hole quick and, you know, get you the yardage. And he was always you the know, guy he, that seemed to be at the right place at the right time in a big moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, a lot of years. I mean, he was, the odds for him to come back and rush for he rushed for a thousand yards, and he was collecting uh, disability from the government. How's that? <laughs> and he, you know, he had the government to, would let him do that. You see, the scars in his feet are just, you know, ooh, something to look at. Not All he, right, he so, so many surgeries. It's just so quiet. I have to ask you this question because I mean, to me, I, I'm actually a Bengals fan, so I hated the Steelers, but I respect the hell out of them, and I realize the reason I hate them is because they usually beat my team. But <laughs> w- w- when you get to it, I mean, you played on maybe the greatest team in NFL history and possibly the worst. You want to tell us about your time with the 1976 well, Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Well, uh, not not very much, no. But it was. <laughs> I tell people, I said no one saw the NFL like I did. My rookie year, we were one and thirteen. Two Super Bowls, zero and fourteen. My last year, it was just. I don't think anybody's ever seen the NFL like that. And uh, no, that was just. That was just. You know, I thought it would be a neat thing to do because it's such a young team, and you can sort of mold things and you know help this, that, this, that, then. With about five weeks, and I'm going, you know, just get this season over well, with. Well, the thing you know, people is... forget is up until the expansion, probably with the Carolina Panthers and was it the Jaguars, up until then, I mean, they made it very difficult on an expansion team to put a decent product on the field. Oh, for sure, for sure. And uh, and it was, you know, you really took your lumps. And it was, you know, Steve Spurrier was, you know, starting. And I kept rooting for him. Let's go, Steve. Get him going, you know. John McKay thought, you know, be when we played Pittsburgh, that he said, Terry, you're going to start this week. It'd be good to start about, good thing to start about your old team. I go, holy shit, what is this all about? And then, then uh, we get up Pittsburgh and we get up there and these guys are just blowing through and Joe Green and grabbed me and laid me down. LC yeah, I think that ended up like 42 to nothing, didn't it? Yeah, we never crossed. I don't think we crossed midfield. And at halftime, now these guys really took it easy on me. At halftime, John said, you know, let's give, let's, 
see if Steve can get something going in the second half. And they just kicked the shit out of him. Oh, they didn't <laughs> he know was, Steve. <laughs> he came out and he said, he came out of the game and said, yeah, your boys took care of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Old but, yeah, I've always wanted to have somebody on a show that played on the 76 Buccaneers team. But about the only ones I could remember were you and Steve Spurrier. Spurrier, yeah. He won't return my calls. <laughs> 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 so you retired after the 76 season. Um, what would you do with your time after that? Was it hard to make the transition from being a professional athlete? No, I was ready because I, you know, I, I, I hung up when I was still 29 years old. And I did, you know, I just didn't, you know, I had played football since I was in fourth grade. Yeah. And it's just a re- regiment every year, you know, it's getting in shape, taking a month off, getting, working out, working out, working out. You know, people see the games and they see the glory, but they don't see the, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, all the, the running and lifting and all the stuff and the injuries and this and that. You know, that, that, that wears on you. And, uh, you know, I knew back, back in that time, you know, you didn't make enough money where you could actually, you know, retire. You know, so you, you you know, I just wanted to start the second profession. So I've worked about 30 years on Wall Street, and, you know, turned out well. All right, so that wasn't near as violent as playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I guess? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never, I never took a hit. All right, so do you still watch the NFL today? Oh, yeah, I love football. Because I've years. talked to a lot of players. Like Robert Brazil has been on the show a few times. Robert doesn't even want to watch it today because he said it's a bunch of wimps. I mean, what's your take on the NFL de- today well, it's a, it's compared a lot to maybe different. 1970? I mean, if, if you slid back in the day, you'd get about four helmets in your back. Yeah. And if you and if you ran out of bounds, I don't know if people remember the Franco Harris used to, you know, people yeah. criticized him for running out of bounds. Now you know, every player runs out of bounds. But Franco... If he needed one yard, he'd go get it. But if he needed ten and he could only get one, no, he's going to go out of bounds. Smart. Yeah. Well, it, and, it extends your career. Yeah, and, and, and you know, in the grasp, you know, no such thing. They, this guy buried you if they had you in a bear hug. I mean, it was so much more brutal back in the day. You know, just watch some of those old films. I mean, I mean, there's still big hits now. But back then there were a lot more. Yeah, but now the big career, hits have to Career ending flag. hits. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them, our whole defense, I don't think, could play today. Well, and no, it's like the all these Steeler fans give me crap about Montez Perfect since I'm a Bengals fan. And I'm like, didn't you ever watch Jack Lambert? Oh, yeah. And you, I mean, Jack and Lambert was changed. as violent as anybody that ever played the game. Yeah, well, our secondary, you know, they were, those guys were, you know, they would they would hit you big time. And, you know, they changed rules because of Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt's still, I think, the best cornerback ever played the game. Yeah, if he's not the best, he's in the top three or four. And the bad thing yeah. is nobody even mentions him. When they, they mention Deion Sanders, who's not oh, nearly as good as him. Forget it. He's 6'4". Yeah, Deion Sanders never hit anybody in his life, I don't think. No, he, Mel was 6'4", 215, and ran a 4'4", 40. Yeah. And, and hit. I mean, well, he had Donnie he Schell, who was a hell of a player. I think he was after Donnie you, Schell, wasn't he? And he would thump you. No, he was the same time. Okay, Glenn he, Edwards. He was Glenn Edwards and uh, Mike Wagner. You know, these guys were... You know, they were, they're were they going to bring the wood. Yeah, I still think, for my money, that's the greatest defense I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. For I mean, you, had, years, you had Hall of Famers all over the place. And then you got guys yeah. like L.C. Green was not even in the Hall of Fame, but should be. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. He left us too early. Good friend. All right, good. well, Terry, it was great having you stop in the show tonight. Well, okay, Mike, listen, any time. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Henry. Or Terry. I almost called you Henry, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's close enough. <laughs> yeah, what the hell. But all right. Thanks, Terry. But, okay, take care. Uh, anytime you want to come back, we'd love to have you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Everybody, it was Terry Hanratty, former quarterback, Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I want to remind you all, you can go to thegruelingcrew.net, check out all of our articles, all of our Legends interviews. Over the last few months, we've had guys like Fred Belidnikoff, Cliff Branch, um, Robert Brazil, Matt Blair, Dennis Smith, Roman Gabriel, Kenny Anderson, a little bit of everybody, so make sure you check that out. You can hear all our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Google Music, um, pretty much anywhere you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Terry Hanratty, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>